first. These are the travel time score for mantle phases and death phases for Gorkhatka, similarly core phases. The travel time curve is the curve between the time and the distance between the epicenter and the station. Similarly, we have represented the travel time curve for Dolka earthquake, showing crustal phases, mantle phases, depth phases, as well as core phases. The travel time curve, we can conclude the following things. The, the travel time curve is a graph of arrival times, commonly P or S waves recorded at different points as a function of distance from the seismic source. From the slope of these curves, the seismic velocity within the earth can be computed. From the arrival time of the P and E earthquake on the seismogram, we can provide a very detailed map of the location of Gorkhartu and Dolkhartu. The apparent velocities of P and E earthquake read from their time distance curve explain the existence of the surface of separation between the crust and mantle term and Moho discontinuity. These Phases indicate there is a presence of more discontinuity between the crust and the upper mantle. Thus, all these converted phases are useful for velocity and geological structure study. These are the references which I have used for my study. And I would like to acknowledge Tribune University for providing sabbatical leave for my PhD study. Similarly, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the Professor Dr. Bidin RL, Head CDP, for expert advice and encouragement for the study. Finally, I'd like to express my appreciation to University Grant Commission, UCC Nepal, for providing PhD fellowships. Thank you and courage. Thank you. Thank you, Ram Krishna, for your very nice presentation. Particularly, uh, you have analyzed 21 seismic phases and probably you will also move to ask the wavelet analysis in the future. Very good. Uh, I would like to open the floor for the questions, comments, please. Uh, just uh, I missed uh, a point that how are those arrival time P and then yes were calculated and uh, was their you know the major significance or the interpretation? Can you please uh, go on it? Thank you. Uh, can can I hear there, sir? Am I listening? Uh, uh yes, yes. How? Do you, okay. How are those arrival time for the P and the Yes were calculated, and their what's their significance? What do they represent? Can you make so it this, clear? Uh, yes, yes, sir. We have used AK one thirty five model. Uh, that was uh, already designed model. Uh, it was mentioned in the slide, but because of the display, it was gone in the slide, and we don't know about what was the model. Actually, it was AK-135 model, seismic model. I would like to say one thing, because you have classified 21 seismic phases on one basis. If you answer this question, probably the will. What are the basis for the interval between the phases that you have selected uh, using your data source? Uh, regarding 21 those phases how you uh, the, those phases are given by the model sir it is a theoretical model i have applied that model uh, for the epicentral distance between the station and the two or uh, earthquake epicenter and the model gives those phases sir. for 21 phases for Gorkha earthquake and 27 phases for Gorkha. it was a theoretical model and uh, that gives uh, those phases Basically, the optimal model sir, to calculate the phases, and the from the arrival time of the P or Yash wave, uh, we can calculate the location of the event, and also the conversion of those seismic wave indicates the discontinuity present inside the Earth. Uh, so we can further study the what kind of dis discontinuity, why those phases gets converted in inside the uh, structure inside the Earth. It will be the basis for the study. Thank you. I have a one question for you guys. Please, please. Uh, so, what was the frequency of this seismic wave? So, it depends uh, on the P wave or Yas wave. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, uh, from the velocity we have to calculate uh, from the study of seismograph. And the velocity of the Yas wave is from 6 to 10 kilometers uh, per second, and the uh, T wave is 10, 6 to 10, and the Yas wave is nearly 60% of that, sir. 
and uh, those phases are obtained at the station and the, from the analysis of the seismogram we get the frequency sir. Um, so did you also like do any analysis for um, like the surface wave or really wave? Uh, no sir, actually uh, it was the it was not a part of the my PhD. I am doing fact right. analysis. So basically, and, uh, my, my, my suggestion uh, will be, you know, like if you can, you know, get the frequency of those really wave uh, or, you know, any kind of surface wave, uh, which I, you know, expect about like in millihertz, uh, yes. those study might help the people uh, who is trying to see any kind of like, you know, delay signal from GPS at the uh, ionosphere. So once you know they have don't, they know the frequency and amplitude of those wave, uh, that will be much helpful to find what is the amplitude when those wave propagate in the ionosphere. Yes, sir. Yes, that will be great, sir. Yes, if I could do that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Sir, you are in mute. Please unmute first. Sorry. Thank you. For for me to wavelet analysis, even for P and S wave, then you can also project other two kinds of waves, as we discussed before as well probably you have time to, to extend your work you are in the early phase it's a very good suggestion thank you uh, so okay. we have um, we have we have to move to the another presenter uh, due to time limitations i would like to invite uh, are you ready monica if not i would like to invite utsav utsav sivakoti University in Nepal, and the title of his presentation is a comparative study of physical properties around NGC 7293 nebula, nebula in Iris and Akari maps. So please go ahead. And again, no sound. Yes, Minister, no sound, right? No sound. This is Uthar Sivakoti and sound. is titled as a comparative study of physical properties around M. Well, I am? No, not coming. Yeah. This is 7293, Nebula in Iris and Akalma. So, and this is 7293, okay, Nebula, and also known as Felix Nebula. So, we did a comparative study in a graphical manner. These are the outlines, but I will be mostly focusing in results and discussion as we have very, very limited time, and I will try to skip as much as possible in the upper region. So, Nebula is dust into steel cloud, gas, and dust, and mainly contains hydrogen and gas. gas. Now, these are the main kinds of Nebula displayed over here, and uh, the best example you can see over here. So, while we study Nebula or any, uh, get see or anything about the same, we need to study about the interstellar medium. So anything that lies in between two heavenly or two distant, distant galaxies are found as interstellar mediums. So that mainly contains gases, radiations, and magnetic So 99% of which are gases and 1% are dust mass. And in case of gases, mostly it contains hydrogen and Whereas in case of dust by mass, it contains different silicates, graphite, diamond, and other different dust. So we use the data from IRIS now defined and also known as IRIS IRIS, which was a joint project from US, UK, and Netherlands and launched in January 1983. This was 10-1 mission that lasted till November 1983. We also use the data from Akari. Uh, Akari in Japanese means light, and this was from JAXA. This was launched in February 2006 and was this mission finally ended in. Uh, May 2011. These are these were our motivations. Uh, the most important motivation we have behind our study was uh, this is the far infrared loops around ATNF, also studied by Keza, VRL, and uh, R. Wayne Berger in 1718. Now, this was done in case of Pulsar that was done in competitive manner between Iris and Akari. Uh, now, we did the similar kinds of studies in case of Nebula. We also intended uh, to do a comparative study in Iris as well as Akari or Scandal. Also, Iris and Okari provide a complete database uh, in different wavelengths that is extremely 
uh, important or useful to study the interstellar dust. These were our main objectives. So the main objectives was to uh, study the three dimensional structure of flux, temperature, speed, and density, mass using the contour map in Iris as well as Akari. Also, we intend to uh, split the Gaussian mass and Gaussian temperature to know the mode of the structure formation. Uh, we wanted to study the spectral density variation along the major and minor diameter for both Iris and Akari. And also, we wanted to predict up whether the structure we are studying or structure under the study is uh, star forming or active. Uh, or a passive order equilibrium structure by using the genes. Formula argument here, you can see the references below. Uh, and uh, this formula has been modified. You can see in case of uh, this is for iris, and in iris, since we use different wavelengths, the formula has been modified. So, the region of interest, uh, we did a lot of study to find the region of interest. We actually studied for around uh, 65 to 70 uh, nebula try to find the best uh, region of interest. Uh, from sky view uh, and this was the final uh, coordinate two different wavelengths iris image over here this is uh, 12 25 and 60 and 100 similarly for akari you can see for 65 90 140 and 160 micrometer images uh, so these images uh, all images were proper so that we could study uh, in a, uh, we could download both fields image and extract the data properly so our method of analysis is uh, really, really simple. This is uh, justified by the chart given here. The data deduction was done by Aladdin 2.5. Calculation were all done in Microsoft Excel 2010. Contour plots were done, that is three contour plots were done in origin version 8. And polynomial and Gaussian fittings were done in version origin, origin version 5. Now we use both origin 8 as well as version 5 according to our convenience. And mostly uh, we also use both origins for some data. This is the contour plot. So we use for lower wave bands uh, in 60 micrometer. Uh, we drew a few contours, and uh, uh, the same contours were used for higher higher uh, wave bands. Similar work was done in case of Akari. Now you can see there is a lot of lot more pixelation in Akari uh, than in uh, Iris. This is the scatter diagram. Scatter diagram generally represents the pixel uh, or shape of the structure. Uh, this is inverted uh, in y-axis. There is a lot of more pixel in uh, Akari. Actually, this is this is extracted in speed mode. That means sampling has been done. Uh, actually, there are more pixels than you can see over here. All the data, all the plots in Akari has been extracted in speed mode. Uh, because there is a lot of data, speed mode means uh, the data has been sampled or a lot of data has been eliminated and sampling has been done. This is the linear plot of flux, uh, the lower flux in y-axis and the higher flux in uh, x-axis. Now the slope of this uh, plot, this linear fitting, will give uh, will help us to calculate the temperature as well as mass. Now this is the flux density density variation iris. You can see these two are this is lower flux and this is higher flux. Violet to red is increasing. These two are quite similar. This is the flux density variation in Akari. The same condition applies. Uh, now we can see here is a lot more counter plots. That means it has got more differentiation or more data you can see. So the region of maximum is not at exactly at the center in both cases. Uh, this is uh, somewhere around the spiral central arm. So this is the counter plot of temperature and mass for iris. Now you can see uh, this is uh, violet is minimum and red is maximum in both cases. Okay, now you can see over here. Uh, this is minimum, whereas in case of mass, it is maximum. That means it applies the inverse temperature mass relation. You accept that uh, it contains inverse mass uh, relation temperature, but uh, uh, more differentiation can't be seen. Whereas in case of Akari, you can see the exact differentiation, like it exactly follows the inverse temperature mass relation. Now, the same condition applies, that is violet to rate is increasing. This is also X, Y, Z counterparts in case of Akari. This is for temperature, whereas this is for mass. You can see massive temperature or more temperature is found in central regions, whereas uh, less mass is found in massive temperature, that is inverse mass relation. This is the plot of a uh, Planck's function. It shows uh, the spectral density in iris and in Akari. Now, this is the counter plots of diameter uh, that we drew uh, for iris as well as Akari. Now, you can see the size difference in iris as well as Akari because we extracted the iris image in 0 0.5 into 0 0.5, whereas Akari image was uh, was downloaded in uh, 0 0.4 into 0 0.4. The counter plots were also drawn independently, so you can see the differences. We also found the major and minor diameter to be 1.52 and 1.31 in iris and 1.18 and 0.89 in Akari. You can see comparative difference in size. So this is the Gaussian fitting of mass versus number in iris as well as Akari. 
Now you can't just uh, simply make any assumption that these graphs, these graphs are not uh, kind of uh, sufficient for us to make any assumption. Uh, Gaussian fitting is not quite seen over here and over here Gaussian nature. I would like to say so. This this is not kind of satisfying for us to say that the region is in thermal equilibrium. So we need more analysis. This is the Gaussian fitting of temperature versus number, and also you can't see any. Uh, kind of uh, Gaussian nature over here, but this helps us to find uh, kind of temperature, Gaussian temperature over here in the, uh, this region, by this region, and in case of mass also, Gaussian mass can be obtained by this region. So this is the Planck function variation along the major diameter in iris, and this is in a cardi. Now you can see, in case of iris also, the uh, regression coefficient for Gaussian is uh, quite higher actually and uh, this shows that the regression coefficient shows that this follows the Gaussian nature however in case of Akari more distinctive uh, plot can be seen you can see the regression coefficient being highest for Gaussian and you can see the uh, normal uh, kind of graph or Gaussian uh, Gaussian plot can be uh, best fitted uh, under these circumstances so in case of major diameter uh, the Planck's function variation shows the Gaussian nature this also helps us to conclude that the region under our study is uh, in a formal equilibrium uh, condition. Similar in case of minor diameter, same results will found. Now the size of the structure we calculated by using this formula is uh, over here. That is in case of iris 1.52 into uh, 1.31, and in case of Akari 1.18 into uh, 0.89. Uh, now I have already mentioned that these two size differences is due to uh, the extraction of image in different sizes, as well as uh, the plot of the contour is also in independent manner. So we calculate the genes mass over here. Uh, and it was found around 4.41 into 10 power 33 in case of iris and 2.4 into 10 power 33 in case of Akari. Uh, now, both of these masses are quite higher than the actual uh, mass of the structure. So, we can conclude that the structure is not uh, a start forming region or an active region. Okay, these are our conclusions. So we calculated the size and also we found that in case of both iris and Akari, the maximum flux is not at the center but uh, towards the central spiral kind of arm. And the minimum temperature in case of a car is found to be 19.90 Kelvin and maximum to be 37.46 Kelvin. Whereas the temperature via the slope of the linear plot in flux uh, variation was found to be around 22.25. Similarly, in case of iris, minimum and maximum were found to be 23.99 and 24.82. Uh, and also, uh, the temperature via the slope of the line was found to be 31.38. And the contours of dark color temperature and dark mass estimation showed inverse region in iris and Akari. Uh, however, for Akari, it is more accurate than iris due to more data and uh, better data, we can say. And the total mass of the dust in our structure was found to be 3.04 uh, in the power 28 in Akari and 6.46 in the power 26 in iris. And now, from genes criteria, we found the mass in Akari to be 2.29 into 10 to the power 33, which is quite higher than the actual mass we calculated. And in case of iris, it's 4.4 into 10 to the power 33, which is also really higher than the mass we actually obtained. So, now this implies the region of our study is not under staff. So, more future work could be done, and like the systematic studies could be done in other structures, uh, or not only in those nebulas, but also in southern as well as uh, northern hemisphere nebulas and other other kinds of bodies too, like uh, stars and other bodies. Uh, we can also uh, do this comparative study in, in more uh, mathematical way uh, rather than just in a graphical way. Also, we can use the same. Uh, image size while downloading and same uh, contours could be used so that uh, the data could quite reflect one or another. So I would also like to thank my supervisor Arisar and co-supervisor Devendra Sir and ANPA for this opportunity along with NPS and PRI uh, and uh, my HUD Prakash Sir and all the faculty members of St. Gaush Mahavidale, my friends and family. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you presented nicely. Uh, you, your confidence level shows uh, you have uh, you you are familiar with every details of your calculation. Uh, I would like to open floor for the questions. I invite uh, you, please, uh, comment, query. I have a comment and also suggestion. I will I will speak later. So please. If you have any Hello. comment, please. So, so no comment probably. Uh, 
Minister, you, I can ask. Yeah, can please, ask please, please, Dr. Mishra, because uh, this is something regarding dust. Uh, he has calculated mass regarding dust. So please. Yeah, so, so basically, I saw one graph uh, showing a tight correlation between 60 and 100, uh, you know, micron. Uh, what does that correlation, uh, you know, explain? Uh, what does that mean? Why there is a tight correlation between 60 micron and 100 micron? Uh, thank you, sir. So, in, in case of uh, iris, am I audible? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead. So, in, in case of iris, we had really limited data, like around uh, 360 kind of something like that pixels. So, I'm quite unclear why uh, it is so, uh, but uh, there is huge differentiation in case of Akari. So, uh, basically, Akari shows better data or it has more pixelation, so it gave better results. Uh, mm -hmm. And our aim was uh, also so, so, so to find if which which could uh, give us better results. Uh, but I'm quite unclear why it is so. So Ajay Swar is asking why there is big difference between Akari and Iris calculations because the wave, the difference in the wavelength is not very high, uh, but your correlation is uh, something uh, need to explain some more thing. So probably uh, my, my, my oh. suggestion my suggestion will be you know i mean because 60 and 100 micron those are like you know like kind of far infrared emission so basically those are you know for coming from you know like macro dust particles uh, and then the, if you calculate the size difference between those dust particles it's not that huge difference uh, so, so basically, they are coming from the same size, you know, almost like similar size distribution. Uh, so that's why they show a very tight correlation. I mean, that's that's my suggestion. Uh, but I will also, you know, like suggest if you can use a speedier data uh, yeah. to to do like yeah. more, you know, see, you know, what, what is the difference between all those three? That will be, you know, I mean, good good work. Okay, thank you, sir, for, for the solution. Yeah, this is true because you have your your uh, nebula is helix nebula, and helix nebula the uh, not the central part but surrounding part of helix nebula is very important. If you go to the smaller wavelength, there are many papers published. This is a very old nebula. This is a called nebula of God. It's a blink. It's like a eye nebula. You know this, so it's better to go, to, better to move to the smaller wavelength rather than go to the Akari longer wavelength. Because to see, like cold, yeah, those are like coal coming from coal dust particles, and if yeah. you see the intensity, I mean, the flux is not that you know huge. Uh, uh, so if I mean, of course, you know, like the small, you know, especially for the what do you say, in ultraviolet or near infrared. Uh, those are you know coming from the PAS, which is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So I think that that will be more important in comparing you know at a higher wavelength. Probably you will discuss uh, later in uh, within your group. Uh, uh, I'd like to add one more thing because time is going running out. I'd like to add one more thing uh, regarding. Uh, uh, you are um, you have uh, feated uh, you have feated you have uh, tried to find Planck function distribution along the diameters. So what I suggest is even you have used Iris or uh, Akari. What I suggest is uh, you have also used sinusoidal function in your feeding. I had seen uh, those plots with the help of sinusoidal function. If you try to find dust oscillation, os oscillation length of the dust. And then if you found very longer length for the oscillation, then you can rule out. You can say this is not possible. Uh, then you uh, start thinking to go to the shorter wavelength rather than go to the longer wavelength. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, because of the time constraint, I would like to uh, invite another presenter of this session. So Susan, Susan Prasad Gautam, if you are ready, I would like to invite Susan. And title of uh, his presentation is Study of Star Formation Rate of Tidal Dwarf Galaxy.
please. So please go ahead. Can you see the screen, sir? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. Namaste. My name is Susan Prasad Gautam. I'm a final semester student at the Central Department of Physics at Google University. And today, I'm going to give a presentation of our research work that is study of star formation weight of digital to our galaxies. These are the outlines of my presentation. I will discuss in these topics. Let me start from introduction. Dwarf galaxies are the dominant types of galaxies in the universe. They are relatively small in size and they are, have low mass and they are usually the components of other galaxies. There are different types of dwarf galaxies. One of them is a tidal dwarf. The properties of the tidal dwarf galaxies are similar to the classical, irregular, and compact dwarf galaxies, but the metallicities in these galaxies are found to be higher and they are found to lie in this narrow range. Tidal dwarf galaxies are very interesting objects to study the process of galaxy formation and the star formation weight is one of the important parameters to understand the galaxy formation and evolution. So we were also interested to study the star formation weight of two new tidal dwarf galaxies. During our study, we followed the different literatures. I have listed some of the important literatures here. Kenika et al. 1998 defined the technique of the alpha measurement and uh, the star formation bed uh, using uh, the alpha luminosity. They also suggested the systematic error in the SFR measurement is served by the internal dust extinction. Hansberger et al. 1998 showed that the faint end of the luminosity function is much increased in pixel compact groups, maybe due to the efficient formation of PDS. There are different methods of uh, the calculation of star formation weight, the ESL measurement, also the UV measurement, solid metal, uh, and uh, the reference when we study the ESL also UV measurement, and they compared the results and they concluded that the UV SFRs are noticed to be slightly lower than the ESL SFRs. And this is in 2011 determined the star formation weight of the dwarf galaxies using uh, the SL5 fluxes, uh, the same technique uh, that we followed for our study. And the star formation rate of the dwarf was found to be 3.2 solar mass per year. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the main objectives of our study is to the SDSS element within the structure and to calculate the star formation rate of the galaxies. Uh, to compare the study with the previous findings, in addition to measure the size of the structure and the flux density distribution within the structure using uh, the photometric technique. This flowchart shows the concrete methodology of the study. First of all, we downloaded the SDSS DR coding website. And we extracted the spectral data using version 9.0 of software. We identified the characteristic peaks and we performed the custom fit of the statistic lines of the spectra. And we used the method of Kennecott for the calculation of the star formation rate. And we compared the study with the previous findings. Uh, in the another part, uh, we performed the photometric analysis. For that, uh, we downloaded the fifth image of the galaxies from the SDS database using SkyView Virtual Observatory. And then we uh, we processed our um, fit images in uh, the software Salsaze, and we performed the photometry uh, to find the overall flux, flux sensitive variation, and the size of the structure. Uh, these are two uh, new galaxies that we have selected from the catalog of Porter Little. We also performed the coordinate query in the Simba database in order to confirm that uh, similar studies have not conducted before for this process. This is the method of Kennecott. Here, the star formation weight is given in the solar mass. The ESL velocity is used for the calculation of the star formation weight. We also added the technique. And for our study, we used the value of Hubble constant as 72 here and here for MBC. Uh, let's go to the result of discussion section. We have downloaded from the SSSDR coding server we plotted using uh, the version 9.0 software. Uh, here we see the spectra of the galaxies. Here we see some exception lines, but uh, the uh, emission lines. We performed the study of these uh, characteristic emissions. 
Uh, this figure shows the Gaussian fit of all the characteristic uh, emissions uh, that are obtained uh, in the spectra of uh, first galaxy. And, and this figure shows uh, the Gaussian fit of all the characteristic peaks uh, in the second uh, galaxy. Here we see uh, the static, statistical parameters that we obtain from the Gaussian fit. Uh, here, uh, the, here we uh, obtain the STSS elements, uh, which are responsible for the characteristic emissions. Here, the other from measurement is uh, important and responsible for the star formation event, and we used uh, this uh, from measurement for the for, uh, for the Gauss Navi star formation event uh, for our study. And uh, this is uh, the statistical parameter for uh, the second galaxy. Okay, using uh, the uh, using the method of technical detail, we uh, we calculated the star formation rate of uh, two digital black galaxies. The star formation rate for the first galaxy was 0.02321 solar mass per year, and for the second galaxy, uh, it was 0.05221 solar mass per year. Uh, we compared our uh, current work with the previous findings of uh, technical detail and analytic. Uh, here we found uh, that the uh, star formation rate uh, for the uh, TDL graph galaxies uh, of the current work uh, is comparable with uh, the previous findings. And uh, but the resting value of our study is uh, a little bit larger. This figure shows the measurement of major and minor diameters of the structure. For this, we used uh, the software Salsazi. It represents the major diameter and CD represents the minor diameter. The major and minor diameters of the first structure is found to be 12.28 arc second and 6.73 arc second, respectively. And for the second structure, we found uh, the major and minor diameters as 9.9 arc second and uh, 6.34 arc second, respectively. For this uh, measurement, we used uh, the R band of SDSS. This figure shows the flux density of the galaxies at the different bands of SDSS. Here we see that the Z band is dominating the other bands, and the minimum flux density was obtained at the U band. Uh, the same trend is obtained for both of the galaxies. This figure shows the flux density variation along major and minor diameters of the first structure at the different bands of STSS. Here we see that the uh, uh, flux density is minimum at first and it increases to the certain level and again decreases to the minimum point. Uh, this indicates that uh, the maximum flux region lies at the central part. And here the Z band is dominating the other bands and the minimum flux is obtained at the U band. Uh, the same trend is obtained in the minor diameter of the structure uh, here around it. Uh, for arc second, we see that uh, the I band is dominating the other bands. This figure shows the flux density variation along major and minor diameters of the uh, second structure at the different bands of SDSS. Uh, here is also Z band is dominating the other bands and a minimum flux after that U band. Uh, this figure also indicates that uh, the maximum flux is implied at the central part. But inter interestingly, for this galaxy, uh, the maximum flux regions are separated into two distinct clusters. I would like to conclude my presentation. We studied the characteristic peaks of SSS spectra and we analyzed it in order to uh, study the abundance of element within the structure. We calculated the star formation rate of uh, new material uh, dwarf galaxies and we compared our study with the previous findings. From the measurement of overall flux density uh, within uh, two structures, we found that the Z band is dominating the other bands and Minimum flux is obtained at the U band. The flux density variation along major and minor diameters suggested that uh, the maximum flux is in slice at the central band. And for the second structure, we found that in major diameter, the maximum flux is in slice uh, uh, at, the, at two different clusters. And these are the references that I followed for the preparation of these uh, presentation slides and the research report. I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Bini Laval, sir, for uh, his guidance, love, and support. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sanjay Baudil, sir, for providing the uh, new catalog of dwarf galaxies. And I would like to thank Association of Nepali Physicists in America for providing uh, this uh, platform to uh, present our work. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your precious time. I speak some important questions and suggestions. Thank you, Susan, for your presentation.
now it's time for the questions comment please Uh, in, in one of the conclusion yeah. you know, point, uh, you have mentioned that uh, abundance, you know, you're trying to find the abundance of different elements, right? Uh, so see, uh, the first point uh, that, uh, you know, your, your Sloan Digital uh, Sky Survey Spectra was analyzed in order to study abundance of element within the structure. So what kind of abundance you are trying to study? Uh -huh. Uh, actually, actually, we, uh, actually, we uh, studied the characteristic peaks and uh, the corresponding SDSS elements uh, within the structures were uh, uh, studied. So, yes. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so might be the billing sir will be the one who can answer this for me. So, sir, yeah, what kind of like elemental abundance you are trying to, you know, get from these structures? Yeah, probably, uh, Susan, you have shown elements that you yes, found sir. on the yes. basis of the characteristics peak in your table. It would be better to show that table just for a moment. Uh, it is, uh, I forgot the slide number, but you should remember. Yes, uh, here, here is a uh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, actually, this kind, this uh, uh, SDSS element, these elements are uh, uh, these elements are uh, uh, listed here uh, with comparing uh, this yes, uh, this wavelengths with the SDSS elements and uh, the yes, uh, uh, SDSS with the SDSS server, and these are the elements that we found uh, responsible for the characteristic emissions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing I would like to add here for Susan, yes. Uh, yes, you have written abundant. That's why he, uh, Ajay, sir, uh, Ajay sir is asking about, you should calculate abundance oh, using okay. the standard okay. metallicity ratio. You have relative abundance, you have also the value of the uh, intensity, you can yes. correct intensity, yes. you can normalize it, and you can value, value the, you can calculate the value of uh, ratio uh, with respect to S alpha or anything else and go to the literature and try to write some values regarding abundance. Uh, okay, sir. The, yeah, then further we can uh, take the ratio of S alpha with the other elements, yes, sir? Otherwise, it's um, not good to write uh, in your conclusion. You have written con uh, abundance, but you have yes. given only the num, uh, only the SGA elements okay i have one uh, suggestion yes sir what i see is you found the prominent emission in z band in all cases along the diameters is it true yes sir so if you z band is very close to that is for infrared yes so why don't you move to the infrared uh, wavelengths rather than go to the r wavelength to do photometry uh, uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, uh, with the counterplots of uh, uh, counterplots of uh, the flux density advance, actually we did the uh, actually we did uh, the uh, uh, variation. Uh, we studied the variation of, of um, overall flux at first, and jet means was demo dominated, and we wanted to uh, study the flux density variations along major and minor diameters at a different band. Um, so that we get uh, some changes or not. At, uh, the Z band was dominating for the overall flux uh, at first. Okay. Okay. So if you do um, photometry using longer wavelength, what I suspect yeah. is you can also correct your star formation rate because you have calculated star formation rate using only spectroscopy, not on the basis of photometry. Yes, sir. Did, so yes, if you sir. do photometric correction using appropriate band, then your value will be um um say uh, most reliable and you can go to the I, I think i think if we go to the measurement then uh, the star formation rate uh, could be a little bit lower actually uh, the previous findings uh, suggested that so we have to calculate the star formation rate using uv measurement too. yes sir uh, thank you other questions if you have a uh, quick questions Thank you, Susan uh, Prasad Gautam Dai. 
I don't have any questions, but uh, like I have find some similarities and some uh, so that I uh, I want to contact with you. If I can get your email address, then I could post some more questions because I have seen a lot of uh, similarities in our research. And I'm yes. only just BSc fourth year uh, final year student. So I would like to connect with you. So can you yes. please post your email address in uh, message? Uh, okay, okay. You, your work is also uh, so nice. You are a leader. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. I will, I will provide you email. Thank you. So now much. we move to another presentation. So thank you. Thank you, you both, uh, particularly the speaker. Uh, now I'd like to invite Suresh Patrai. And after this, I would uh, pray for Monica if you are ready. Okay. So. Uh, Suresh Patrai, uh, his uh, title of presentation is All Nepal Asteroid Search Campaign Opportunity to Discover Asteroid from Nepal. So please, uh, Mr. Patrai. Uh, thank you, Vinay, sir. Uh, thank you, and here for this opportunity. Uh, am I all even now? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, thank you. So uh, today, uh, I'm, th this is uh, I have seen other presentations. So it's uh, not that much technical. It's more about uh, telling how uh, we are creating an opportunity for high school student, actually, uh, as well as university student, to have an opportunity to understand how basic research or astronomical research or astrometry works. Uh, uh, so that they can continue uh, their passion uh, doing uh, more deeper research uh, in the career. So uh, I will be basically uh, telling about sharing about some uh, uh, ideas about it. So uh, we we called it All Nepal Expert Search Campaign A N we call ANAC. Uh, it's actually a hands-on astronomy program for high school students and university students as well as teachers, uh, and it provides a unique opportunity to make original discoveries of asteroids. So those asteroids might be from a main belt or uh, near Earth objects or trans Neptunian objects. Uh, so we provide uh, data uh, to the participants uh, from uh, uh, US uh, and they will be working on that uh, using specific uh, software. So it was uh, how it was possible. We, we, we made it as a part of our collaborative approach. So we partnered with International Astronomical Search Collaboration, we called IJAC. Uh, it's a citizen science project. Now it's got funding from uh, NASA, so it's more uh, robust than before uh, because they have uh, more infrastructure where we can report. Before we used to email all the reports, now we can submit our report uh, uh, from web. So uh, today we have about 26 uh, collaborators and uh, Harding Simpson University is taking lead uh, for this initiative. So if, uh, if I want to share about how it works, uh, basically, uh, uh, we select the teams and then uh, those teams will receive data and those data is actually coming from uh, the, uh, the uh, we are taken uh, during the moon's third quarter to first quarter. Um, uh, so it's like a monthly uh, campaign and it runs throughout the year. And in Nepal, we are running about nine campaigns uh, per year. Uh, so that's our target, a minimum six uh, to nine. And uh, once we provide those in, uh, images to the student, they utilize, uh, they, they use uh, the software called Astrometrica, and they actually do CCD astrometry and analyze data looking at different parameters like uh, signal to noise ratio, uh, magnitude, uh, uh, this, uh, the path, whether it's moving or not, uh, and the size uh, and the uh, shape of the object as well. And then once uh, uh, they analyze, they prepare a report in a format called Minor Planet Center, we call MPC report. That's a standard format for reporting uh, the minor planets to IAU. And then they, they upload that uh, through our web portal. Uh, so the image set actually is coming from the uh, Institute for Astronomy, uh, which is at Hawaii. And it, it uses PANSTAR-1 telescope, which is 1.8 meter uh, telescope. And PANSTAR stands for uh, panoramic Solving Telescope and Rapid Response System, uh, high field astronomical imaging system developed and operated by uh, IFA uh, at University of Hawaii. So about the software, it's, it's, it is also from one of our collaborators among 26 collaborators. So uh, we are using for the uh, 
is of the data image set received from the PanStar. Uh, and uh, basically, we provide a license to every registered mm -hmm. participant, whether they are teacher or student. Uh, if they don't have license, they can use at least 100 days uh, evaluation uh, format. And uh, you can see the, uh, like uh, the graph is here. So once they load the image, there are two techniques. One is uh, doing uh, this manual search and automatic search. Uh, so in automatic search, uh, basically we are doing automatic search, promoting automatic because manual is quite difficult. And we are only allowing students for manual search uh, who are already exposed and have the experience of to doing it. So uh, for the uh, uh, automatic search, once we run that uh, the image in the system, uh, the software, so it will uh, check uh, the moving object and the student will basically identify those moving objects. And if it is already known, then the, uh, the designations will be popped up if it's empty, but there is some uh, nice this Gaussian feed, linear feed, and signal to noise ratio is also uh, fulfilling the roads criteria like that five or greater than five and the magnitude the v uh, value of v is not very fluctuating that means the, the magnitude of this object moving object is constant and also uh, these objects uh, are moving in a straight line uh, compared uh, to uh, its surroundings and so far uh, we have um, uh, Total of 1440 participants, including 240 teachers in this program. We started this uh, from uh, 2016. Uh, and these are the discovery status that uh, we have no discovery in 2016, 2017, we have six preliminary, 2018, we have uh, eight, eight, 100 uh, preliminary, and 2019, we have 586 preliminary plus seven uh, provisional. That means uh, these seven will get uh, numbered soon, and then uh, the person the team who discover it will get an opportunity to name it. So that's the catch. So if uh, someone works on it and uh, if they, they they mark something to be an asteroid and it get verified, then they get an opportunity to name that. So in 2020, by, by now, there are 97. You can see the number of discoveries dec decreased uh, in 2020. That's because we are doing more in manual sense. Uh, and also uh, the size of the team we reduced from 30 teams of quota to uh, 15 because uh, we found it uh, quite uh, uh, unstable handling the team because there are original data coming in and we wanted to make sure that every data will be looked in. Th these are the uh, total provisional discoveries so far. Um, so you can see 2018 ISP, 2019 A18, so by students and uh, these are the, uh, by, you can see the 2018 IS4 is by the student of class nine of celebration poetry. And the second one, 2019 AE4, the AE18 is by the student of SOS school in Sanotini. And likewise, 2019 JP60 is by the uh, this uh, uh, central uh, Kendriya Vidyalaya uh, of Indian Embassy. And 2019 KV15 is by Austral campus. 2019, it's, it's by uh, this KM, uh, KCMIT and uh, from Chitwan, one of my colleagues, uh, Neeraj uh, Langwichani as well, and 2019 uh, with uh, uh, teachers. Uh, so uh, these are uh, the so far discovered, and we are expecting more uh, reports of provision because we are putting a lot of effort uh, doing manual. So we expect more uh, provisional status of uh, pre uh, preliminary discoveries uh, from earlier campus. So uh, if uh, you can easily uh, identify these objects, this is a minor planet center where you can uh, put your, uh, these uh, names uh, that I uh, mentioned before. Uh, anything like, for example, for comet noise, we can put here and look for the details in this minor planet database. Uh, so I have uh, checked this all for this, like uh, how it looks. Uh, you can see this blue and yellow part, this uh, orbital part is for comet. Uh, sorry, uh, the asteroids, and uh, we have out of seven, we have six uh, main belt asteroids and one uh, uh, near Earth object, uh, NEO, uh, and near Earth asteroid. So uh, its uh, period is like different, like 5.2 uh, two, two years, so different uh, periods are there. Okay. Yeah, two minutes, yes. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, 3.4 years, this is 4.29, 4.17. So these, these asteroids have actually uh, different uh, uh, duration uh, periods. And there are uh, different uh, epoch, epoch is there, anomaly is there. So uh, 
the idea is so far we have seven provisional. So now the next step is we are planning to have a more number of provisionals so that uh, once it get numbered, the one thing is we name it and then what next? So that's for the popular stuff uh, for the outreach. But we are also looking into more uh, detailed science so that uh, we can have, uh, you know, we, we want to have uh, people working on this and calculate the uh, this uh, other details like what uh, is reported to Minor Planet Center. Uh, so th this can be uh, some of the research projects for the at least undergraduate level students. Uh, we are planning actually I was planning to assign some students for seven this uh, uh, provisional to uh, students that I, I since I am engaged with the three center campus, I was supposed to give uh, uh, this work uh, to one of the students, but this year no one approached me for the project. So uh, probably it will be next next year or uh, we'll be working uh, through uh, NASA. Um, so uh, for all the details, uh, you, know, you can uh, go to this website, uh, Nepal Astronomical Society org slash asteroid search, where we post details time and often. And next campaign starts in uh, August. Uh, Basically, we, we take 15 teams and in order to help them understand how to search, how to use those apps, uh, to discover, we are offering two days uh, and it's two days in a sense, but in hours, it's six hours uh, training course uh, online and off uh, in person face to face uh, for students and teachers so that they learn how to search and they, uh, they, they, they discover the asteroid and get an opportunity to name. Uh, but the process is very lengthy, so people who don't have passion may not be interested to participate. Uh, once you have it discovered and uh, it get uh, provisional status, it will take another five to six or maybe seven years to get numbered, and then only will be provided to name it. So it's a long process because it's a uh, full, uh, it has to go through all the IAU uh, uh, IAU procedures uh, to be uh, name, numbered and named. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Suresh, for uh, this very nice, wonderful presentation. Uh, particularly, uh, this sort of work, this is actually preliminary data analysis. It's, it, it needs uh, lots of patience uh, to work on uh, the raw data and try to find something. Uh, thank you. So, I would like to open floor for the common questions. Queries, please. I have a small query. I will ask later. I think you know this is the uh, best uh, you know outreach program we can do in Nepal. Uh, but is there any way like uh, you know you guys can write some kind of proposal for like a small telescope like 18 or you know like 20 inch telescope uh, so that we can establish somewhere in Nepal and you know uh, do the real time observation for these asteroids. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you for the questions. Yeah, actually, we, we are working with some of our friends in this region. Uh, so we also had some discussions with our Pakistani friend who is actually tracking these uh, objects because uh, it might be difficult for us to uh, have a setup to discover, but we are planning to have some computerized setup which will help us to uh, verify uh, absorbing uh, pre uh, pre-discovered astro asteroids and comets. Uh, uh, so, getting minor planet codes. Uh, so that's that's our plan. But I don't know how long it takes. But we are planning on that. Thank you. Great. I my question would be like a follow up question or a similar question. Uh, so, are, are you accessing the data that they provide, and is it like online, or do you have to uh, do they send you manually? Uh, uh, for this, uh, as as in my presentation, um, so uh, the our collaborator has uh, some funding from uh, NASA now, so they have invested that to build up some uh, infrastructure. So before they used to say it individually, you know, uh, so we have a website where we put data and students will get a login details, those participants, they will log in and download those data and analyze and again report that uh, uh, MPC to us. Uh, and then our collaborator will report that back to MPC. So it's not that we are re directly uh, reporting to Minor Planet Center. Uh, Hardy Institute University is actually reporting to Minor Planet Center. 
uh, because uh, we don't have uh, MPC code to report. So we are just being a part of it. But this is great, nice, nice work. And uh, another question would be like, uh, are you planning to uh, extend beyond asteroid? Look for other exoplanets. Uh, I, I didn't hear you properly. <clears throat> so this is great. Um, and I was wondering if you if you are planning to uh, extend this to exoplanets and uh, other other objects, objects um, and asteroids. Uh, yep. So in in fact, uh, we just expand. We it we didn't discover. So Vinita was also involved. So we we just named uh, uh, one exo world last year. Uh, probably this is uh, one of the greatest things that happened in astronomy outreach in Nepal so far. So yep. I was looking into the data and uh, the vote casted was uh, among the hundred uh, best uh, best among countries. So I was looking into the data, asking about the, our team uh, to give you know, how much vote casted in other countries. He was unable to provide me all the data because it was huge, 100 plus countries participated. So it was difficult for him to provide all these information. But uh, then I wanted to check the SARC and SARC, we are the best. So we are the highest number of votes. Uh, even we, we, I think, outnumbered India um, uh, on voting. Um, yes, we are planning for comets and uh, we are planning for supernova. Uh, supernova, there, there is one uh, another project by the same con uh, consortium. So we are planning for ex uh, supernova uh, and comets, uh, not the uh, exoplanet at the moment. Great, great work. Wow, very good question. So, okay, thank you. I would like to ask one query right now, uh, this moment. Uh, could you please show one of your plot in which uh, one of your diagram in which you showed you calculated you know the epoch you know the eccentricity uh, do you have information if you go to that for any of your findings asteroids uh, with orbits uh, if you can uh, i don't know whether your um, software can calculate some sort of coordinates for example uh, uh, considering co-moving coordinate system or any sort of coordinates of that particular object is there a possibility to find out the find out to fix the coordinate if you do that then we can do some mathematics uh, we can solve three body problem uh, considering some well-known asteroid we have and uh, do something more uh, with that celestial object new newly found celestial object so so this uh, yes, sir. The, um, uh, the data that I showed is uh, the extraction from Minor Planet Center. So it was not uh, generated by myself. What I did is I put those uh, coordinate the names like uh, YS fourteen five, and then I put there and search, and it will provide uh, the all the data. So I was yeah. more interested in the uh, period of those uh, those uh, asteroids. But uh, yes, we we get uh, those uh, coordinates. Uh, we get this. Uh, coordinates in this uh, we'll discuss later um, probably some problem with your mic is i'm not listening not hearing uh, okay. At okay 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 uh, thank you I thank you okay. thank you sir thank you so much one, uh, there is one there is one short question if you have any short questions just uh yes no type yeah. questions. i please. want to ask a question to suresh uh, yeah, so is there any plan this project will be performed through bigger citizen science platform like Zooniverse, so it would be more convenient in that situation? True, yeah. Uh, yeah, Zooniverse uh, has uh, its own platform, so the, it's, it's run by a different uh, different um, uh, consortium. So this is RAS is a, a different consortium, so they have some uh, collaboration among them. So Zooniverse team and ISC teams are meeting and interacting time and often. Um, so, okay. but at the moment, I don't think that uh, it's, it's a di in a different stream, but with the same objectives of doing uh, more dedicated, you know, it's, it's like universe, uh, you don't get a, a, a person to person, a peer to peer support, but this program, you get peer to peer support, like it's not, uh, the registered people will get support directly from IASC if needed. So though we uh -huh. are supporting, because at the time we are supporting, we are also developing our capacity uh, to understand the uh, process, to understand uh, the system. Uh, but if we say we can't do it, they will handle it directly. Uh, okay. So it's a peer, a peer support system, uh, unlike Juniors. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rishi. 
Thank you very much. Now I move to another presenter. Thank you, speaker. So, uh, Monica, are you ready? Yes, sir, I'm ready, but the video is not working, so I will present it by myself. Okay, fine. So, share your slide and go ahead. Here is uh, uh, Ms. Usa Josi after this presentation. So, please uh, share your slide, Monica. Can you see my slides? It's coming. Can everyone hear me now? Now it's perfect. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm really sorry for it. Please make it slide so. Okay, fine. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think uh, everyone rest the uh, professor, respect the teachers, and all the dear participants here. I'm Monica Karki and currently pursuing a master's degree at Omrit campus. Uh, today I'm here to uh, present our research work on entitled analysis of total electron content using uh, GPS observation during uh, Nepal earthquake. This work is performed under the supervision of uh, Professor Dr. Naren Prasad Tapagai. Okay, these are the outline uh, of my today's presentation. Okay, starting with um, Earth atmosphere, so we all are well known about Earth atmosphere, which is an uh, insulating layer of uh, gases uh, that provides suitable uh, environment uh, for all living beings. Uh, it is uh, made up of a large number of uh, elements. Uh, it contains 78% uh, of nitrogen, 21% of oxygen, and similarly other types of uh, gases. So if we move uh, apart from the ground level, uh, uh, it is further divided into uh, five different uh, layers, uh, namely uh, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, uh, thermosphere, and exosphere. But our uh, main reason of interest is uh, ionosphere, which extends uh, from the top of the middle atmosphere to a uh, few hundred of kilometers into space. So it is highly ionized uh, layer of up upper atmosphere, which is directly affected by solar activity and other uh, that directly coming out uh, from uh, from space. So um, it has uh, different parameters like uh, ion temperature, electron density, uh, electron temperature. So one of the basic and uh, important uh, parameter is uh, TEC, uh, which is uh, known as total electron content. Uh, it means a uh, number of free electron that lies along the path between a satellite and a receiver. One TEC unit equals to 10 to the power of 16 uh, electron per meter square. So our main uh, work is uh, based on uh, the Gorkha Nepal earthquake. Specifically, uh, Nepal is very active uh, region in the world. Uh, in uh, April 2015, uh, we had faced with a very large earthquake. Uh, more than uh, 10,000 people were died and many more were uh, injured. Earthquakes are a natural phenomena, which is uh, least, uh, least understood and more destructive. What is in this slide? Okay, our uh, main objectives uh, behind this work is to know the relation between uh, ionospheric perturbation, uh, uh, ionospheric perturbation uh, events, and to know whether there is actually a relation between them or not. So our uh, our work is uh, based on GPS data. This is 
the way to uh, calculate PEC from a satellite to receiver. First, uh, slant TVC is uh, obtained by uh, integrating uh, over receiver to satellite, where N is uh, electron density. Uh, but in our work, uh, we uh, observed a vertical TEC, which was obtained by taking the projection from slant to vertical using height of um, 350 kilometer. Here, theta is elevation angle, and uh, R is radius of Earth, which is uh, 6378 kilometer. So our main, uh, uh, we have uh, here we have selected four GPS uh, station over different sites of uh, Nepal according to the nearest distance from our uh, earthquake uh, epicenter. Here it indicates with uh, uh, earthquake magnitude. Okay, first, we uh, observed uh, TEC values for the month of uh, March, April, and May from uh, our station. Uh, normally, temperature is high uh, in this uh, in this uh, month in comparison to in comparison to other months. Uh, each uh, each uh, station has a similar pattern. Maximum TEC values are reached between uh, 6 UT to uh, 13 UT, while the minimum TEC occurring and then uh, gradually decreases after sun. So, but in uh, 2015, April has uh, appeared a uh, highest uh, TC followed by March and was lowest TC in May. Usually, this trend was not followed every year. Every year. That's why um, that increment in April, April month lead us to go for the study on it. So, here we uh, observe the time series. Uh, analysis of TC value for the period of 30 days. It includes both uh, data before and after to main uh, main talk. So here arrow indicate uh, earthquake earthquake uh, day and where other uh, black circle represent the um, TC anomaly. So we can observe a uh, positive anomaly on up in two, uh, three, as well as in you know, 14th and uh, 23, 24th a low TC value on uh, April 11, but here I indicate only those uh, values which has appeared a uh, higher TC value even though uh, they were uh, quite uh, this according to um, National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric uh, Administration. So the remaining days we saw the high TC value had some uh, geomagnetic storm, so that could be the reason to increase in TC value on that day. So we observed a similar type of results from uh, two other stations as well. Okay, next, uh, geomagnetic and solar activity can produce uh, anomalies and changes in ionosphere. So to confirm whether they were uh, affected by other activities or not, uh, we choose two important uh, geomagnetic indices, uh, DST and KP. Here, uh, KP value with um, greater than three represents uh, repre represents magnetic storm and DST index uh, lies within a uh, positive 20 nano tesla to negative on um, 20 nano tesla so it's very quite here we can observe uh, the 17th of april 25 16th and 17th hide some minor uh, geomagnetic storm and here uh, 24 and 25th uh, were quite clear, so even they had appeared with high TC value. So next, uh, here we compare the TC value of April 25 with other uh, quite a day from four stations. Though April 25 itself was a quiet day, so we can clearly observe that uh, there was significant uh, increment in TC value of uh, compared to other days in uh, this TC. Uh, maybe due to earthquake. Okay, in addition to our work, uh, we observed the difference of TC value between April 25 with other uh, quite a day to know how much value was uh, deviated from our uh, original value of uh, TC. So, in compared with uh, other days on April 25, it was that uh, the normal uh, abnormal. Um, the duration increase increased by up to 30 percent. Uh, 30 percent at uh, Chile and 
Kokoni station. And whereas it was increased by uh, mute Four yeah, minutes left from NAST uh, station. So this abnormal, abnormal scene in a C6 radiation before the events uh, lasting up to uh, eight hours. This is indicated by blue line here. So lastly, we had plotted uh, the distance from all four stations with their respective TEC value. It shows a higher TEC value uh, near to the epicenter, and when it goes far from the uh, earthquake epicenter, it has low value. So it shows the TEC value of this is it, uh, with increasing uh, distance. So here we came with a confusion that analysis of vertical TEC uh, from uh, distance. GPS station so the uh, abnormal GC variation appeared few days up to few hours before the uh, main event and TC variation is dominant uh, near the earthquake uh, center so uh, it is important to know the locality of event, so how they attach to the center so uh, depending on their magnitude, by using various uh, Technology, we can detect uh, a future epicenter as well. So, um, this is just the baseline of my work. Uh, so, further study is uh, required to know the exact relation between different parameters like solar activity, which is, uh, and, uh, and to see whether these uh, parameters can be used for earthquake uh, precursor or not. So, I would like to thank. Uh, Professor Dr. Narin Porsha Sapagai for his guidance and supervision and all the other people who helped me directly or indirectly throughout this work and all the organizing committee of ANPA uh, which provides an opportunity for us. Okay, here is some references uh, that I had gone through uh, to complete my study. Uh, thank you everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for your nice presentation. You try to explain uh, what you have found, particularly in the result and discussion section. You try to connect with solar activity to TEC and to the earthquake. Okay, I have some suggestion. I will uh, speak later. So now it's time for questions, queries, comments, please. If you have any suggestions, questions, comments, please. Have you, be, have you been able to connect uh, the data, like the variation in electron uh, counts to um, like uh, different levels of earthquake, let's say five megawatt earthquake? Have you been able to correlate the data to like different levels? Yes, uh, earthquake, uh, atmospheric perturbation due to earthquake uh, depends on uh, local, reasonably, like it depends on local effects. So it depends on uh, magnitude uh, and its uh, depth. So by this uh, way, uh, we can uh, maybe connect. I mean, are there like databases? Do you have like uh, major data on lower scale earthquakes as well, so that you can do more analysis? No, 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 we don't do this. Okay. Hey, nice talk, very interesting. Thank Other you. questions? The import will be suggestion probably. Uh, so no more questions. So I would like to suggest one thing, and I have one query. Uh, important thing is, uh, you know, TEC is strongly affected by solar activity, isn't it? TEC is very. They have a very good relations. You know all these things. You have also shown. Uh, two relations so tc is strongly affected by solar activity and you are trying to correlate tc with earthquake event so this means you are trying to correlate solar activity to the earthquake so this uh, there is a branch there are many papers many good paper called uh, helioseismology and they have connected they have predicted they, they even used to predict uh, 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 so you have to look at the solar activity data as well. If you go through the, because you have correlated and try to say event is there and you found this sort of uh, 
TEC, you also calculated vertical TEC as well. Uh, probably you can also calculate other parameter, uh, uh, other parameter, parameter related to TEC. So I better suggest to go through the heliosismology. There are very preliminary empirical relations that relate solar activity to the magnitude of the earth earthquake as well as depth. Uh, we all we have a data of Gorkha earthquake. You can have even wave, the nature of the wave. You can have a uh, depth of um, uh, your particular day, a depth of earthquake, as well as other parameters. So I think it's a, it will be a very good work if you try to correlate with the help of some empirical relations that is already established. There are many relations in heliosismology. Uh, this is my suggestion. Very good. You try. You attempted very nice uh, work. Try to see whether it is related with solar activity or not. Can, can I second thing is. Suggestion? Second thing is. Now this is more critical because you know uh, ionospheric TEC. Uh, ionospheric TEC is characterized by absorbing uh, carriers uh, phase de delays. Do you know phase delays? Yes, sir. Which is very important. And this delay is related with uh, Earth. So, uh, the, the details of phase delays of received radar signals that is obviously from uh, the radio um, radio wavelength. Uh, sorry, radio signals uh, transmitted uh, from the satellites. Uh, you have taken data from the satellite uh, to calculate TC. Uh, so. Uh, there is a scope uh, of um, scope uh, uh, of relation of rela relating earthquake and solar activity. Thank you. Very good. So, uh, so don't stop here and go ahead with your uh, work and try to relate with solar activity and earthquake using heliosismology. I have I have one more suggestion, Mr. Yeah, please, please, uh, uh, Dr. Misra. Uh, so basically, you know, when you guys are working with uh, TEC, uh, basically what I understand is uh, you are increasing the density, you know, like the number of electron in ionosphere. Uh, but my, you know, thinking is uh, the earthquake is more like pressure wave uh, in the atmosphere, right? So basically it's not creating the additional electron in ionosphere. Rather, is you know changing the density of those ionosphere, and then you have like different you know delay in the reflection and refraction of uh, those radio waves. Uh, so so basically, you know, I'm, those two things should be you know like distinct from each other. Yeah, it's very difficult to correlate. It's true uh, because oh, some uh, yeah. Please go ahead. And that also, term. you know, if they can, you know, uh, work with the Doppler shift, you know, like the, that will also help a lot. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Because earthquake is a very fascinating area. So people try to correlate with uh, uh, other atmospheric or even nearby space parameters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Monica. Thank you so much sir, uh, for such a wonderful suggestion. I am very new in this field, so I will go further more on it. So thank you. Now uh, we have uh, one presenter, uh, Mrs. Usa Joshi. She is the last presenter of today's this session. So she is going to present uh, her work entitled Impacts of Sunshine Hour, Ambient Temperature and Relative Humidity on Total Solar Radiation, total solar radiation at Mid Hill Region, Nepal. So please, uh, Usa Madam, please. Thank you, sir. Some 
dropping out. Some problem with the mic. Or... Yes, sir, okay. not working. Sound is not coming out. Uh, probably it will come. What's the problem? Gyan, did you check that, you know, video mode and text mode while sharing the content? Yeah. Yes, sir. Good. I mean, setting. Professor, chairperson, and participants of, participants of the conference. I am Usai Joshi, PhD scholar at Truman University, Nepal. The title of my research work is Impacts of Sunshine Hour Event Temperature and Relative Humidity on Total Solar Radiation at Mid Horizon, Nepal. The following are outlines of my presentation. Moving on to introduction. Total solar radiation is the sum of the beam solar radiation and diffused and scattered solar radiation. The solar radiation is the is generated from the steady conversion of hydrogen to helium by nuclear fission reaction. Sun converts about 5 million tons of mass per second in the form of electromagnetic radiation and distributed in terms of electromagnetic spectrum with wavelength between 0 0.3 to 3 micrometer. Solar radiation is largest renewable resource on Earth. Studies, studies on solar radiation have become an important for renewable energy issues stemming from energy crisis, global warming, and other environmental problems. The, uh, the, as we see from the slide, the maximum proportion of the energy is provided by traditional sources like fire, wood, then comes uh, the fossil fuels and smallest proportion by the renewable energy, about 30 to 40 percent of hard on foreign currency spent on importing petroleum products. From the first chart, we can see that maximum amount of energy is used for cooking. And from second chart, we can see that thus required energy is pro produced using LPG gas. Such status of energy consumption is neither sustainable nor desirable from environmental point of view. Also, it is negative impact on health. Nepal lies in most favorable range of solar belt in global map. Global map. Nepal has about 300 sunny days in a year and about 6.8 6 sunshine hours per day. And Nepal has higher solar radiation potential at Western High region in comparison to other area. In this research work, I have used these formula, formulas to calculate the extraterrestrial solar radiation. I have used these empirical models based on the sunshine hour temperature, relative humidity to feed the data. And on moving to the objective of the study, to study uh, the objectives are the, to estimate the total solar radiation potential at measuring site, to study the factors affecting total solar radiation, to test the different models for given site. On moving to the methods and instrumentation, the measuring site is Kathmandu Valley. The latitude is 27.7 degree north. Altitude is 1350 meter from sea level. And the methods and, uh, and the hourly data of TSR measured 
measured by CMP6 parameter and meteorological parameter were collected from the Department of the Hydrology and Meteorology Government of Nepal for the year 2010 to 2015. Um, the CMP6 parameter based on thermopile sensor creates temperature difference when radiation fall on it gives the temperature difference proportional to the voltage which converts into intensity of the radiation data are analyzed and processed after then used in model uh, as mentioned earlier to get the empirical constraints using regression technique. Empirical constraints used to estimate daily total solar radiation of the year which compared with the major data uh, of the uh, global solar, uh, total solar radiation and for validation of data statistical tools are used. Moving to the result and discussion, the table shows the correlation between the total solar radiation with the meteorological parameter. Total solar radiation is positively related to maximum temperature and negatively related with the relative humidity. But clearness index uh, has the co uh, good uh, correlation with the, all the parameters. Uh, the plot shows the seasonal variation of total solar radiation, and in the spring, the uh, highest value of total solar radiation uh, is attributed due to less zenith angle, less cloud, and in winter, due to the large zenith angle, hazy weather provides the less total solar radiation. And standard deviation is high in summer, indicating fluctuation in the total solar radiation and sunshine hour due to high rainfall cloud, cloud cover sky. And this also can be shown, uh, seen on the box plot also. This is monthly variation of TSR for all the years. Brown line gives the mean TSR for all the years. Month July, August and September has lower value of TSR is due to the cloudy sky and heavy rain. In 2015, TSR was least. This is the yearly variation of measured total solar radiation and rainfall. Rainfall is maximum in 2013. The this figure gives the monthly variation of TSR with the maximum temperature and, re and relative humidity. TSR is directly related with temperature and inversely related with the relative humidity. In Mars and uh, Mars, no, due to the weather is dry, relative humidity is low. In August, due to high rain, relative humidity is high in this time. This figure gives the monthly variation between the total solar radiation and rainfall and sunshine hour. The TSR is inversely related with rainfall and directly related with the sunshine hour. In the month of July, sunshine hour is lower here as rainfall is maximum. Here is the linear feet of measured and estimated TSR using the daily data where model E19 based on uh, humidity, temperature, and sunshine hour has higher value of coefficients of determination. This table gives the empirical constant and statistical indicator for different models using the Delhi data. And Delhi, um, for a better model, we choose highest value of R square and lower value of statistical tools. Here, e, uh, E19 model has higher value of R square and lower value of RMAC and MP than the other models, so we choose it as the better model on average. And this plot gives the monthly variation of measured and predicted TSR for 2016 for Kathmandu, Kumultar, and Pani Pokhari. The predicted value is slightly less than measured value due to as it is depends upon the different meteorological parameters. To the conclusion, the annual average total solar radiation is found to be 14.46 uh, megajoule per meter square per day and total TSR is uh, 5276 megajoule per meter square per day. Maximum TSR is occurred on the May 13, 2012 and minimum TSR occur, is occur in the first March of 2015. TSR is affected by meteorological parameter uh, like an hour rain for relative humidity, temperature, and empirical constraints of selected model that is E19 can be used to predict the TSR at similar climate uh, region of the Nepal. Acknowledgement.
Uh, moving to the acknowledgement, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Central Department of Physics, Department of Physics, part of multiple campus, also campus, Amrit Campus, Institute of Science and Technology, Department of Hydrology and Meteorology, uh, Nepal Academy of Science and Technology, Organizing Committee of ANPA Conference 2020, my family and friends. These are the references. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam, for your uh, timely presentation. As a, um, very Thank nice, you. and you, your data uh, uh, in the form of plots, uh, types and plots. Thank you. Uh, and now it's time for questions. I have a couple of comments. Uh, particularly for a few plots. Yes, sir. Please, um, please uh, first of all, I'll speak later. If there is any questions, comments. Also the suggestion, this is, um, yeah can i ask one question yeah, please please yeah so uh, yeah, just for the sake of my like education uh does the air quality uh, impact on such studies if so yes, then sir. how it is taken care yes sir excuse me sir Yeah, should I repeat my question? Yes, sir. Okay, so my just uh, I was just curious, like if the like air air quality uh, impacts on such uh, like the your result, uh, because I've not seen like uh, that uh, mentioned anywhere. Uh, but but no. I don't know if that is like uh, already addressed with the humidity things, or uh, how does it work in this study? Yes, uh, I use here, sir, only uh, meteorological parameters uh, using on the models. Uh, I do not only refer to on these air qualities directly, sir. The air quality based on this relative humidity, temperature, and rainfall also. These meteorological parameters affect on the uh, solar radius. I am showing uh, uh, only these relations sir, here. follow up question on that actually so is it possible to include uh, dust particles or air particles uh, depending on uh, yes sir uh, as in terms of parent, uh, perturbations to the empirical models uh, yes sir Minister, you are muted. We didn't hear you, Minister. Yeah. We didn't hear you, Minister. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, I was just adding regarding the particulate matter. If, uh, uh, Usta Madam can add particular matter because she had data rainfall. Uh, uh, important thing is humidity and also uh, other parameter that relate with air quality. That's just a comment. If other questions, if we have us, if you have other questions, comments. Uh, probably, uh, probably not. Uh, I have a comment on few plots, particularly on, you have shown many plots, monthly variation, yearly variation, a variation of TSR with the pressure and many parameters, uh, particularly the variation of TSR with temperature uh, and uh, other parameters shown 
you have a human uh, error bar in those plots because it's very important because uh, you have collected data that is your that is ground based data so you should know error bar also in some plots probably in monthly variation of TSR, you have yes. given error for a few plots uh, and uh, no error bar for in the same plot. We can see error bar for one set of data and no error bar for other set of data Just regarding error bar. Now, this is um, your observed data. You need to be uh, very careful with your uh, data uh, fluctuations in your data. You should understand. Okay. You know, what sort of should be there this is because this is okay, sir. okay sir i will do uh okay so uh, thank you uh in this session in this session eight presenter present uh, this work uh very effectively and uh, i'd like to thank participant as well for the comments these questions uh thank you you all uh so we are running out of time so probably this is the final session next session will be combined session so i would like to hand over this session i would like to close this session by saying thank you all and thank you and uh, for organizing conference as well as for inviting me to check this session thank you Thank you, Bill, sir. sir, for your time, uh, we would move ahead to our uh, next uh, session right away. Uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, I'm here. The chair of session, and I believe, uh, who's